Welcome to Fresh Outlook on this last week of July. Hello to all of our viewers here in the U.S. and abroad. I'm Nia Toski. We have been watching tragic news from all corners of the world this week. We're going to talk about the three plane crashes, the crisis in the Middle East, and immigration. But we promise to lighten things up with a lightning round. Now, if you're just joining us for the first time, we take a look at the latest news and bring you a fresh outlook with our expert panel. Let's begin with the plane crashes. There have been solemn ceremonies in the Netherlands as the remains of more people returned home. As we all know now, Malaysian Airlines Flight 17 was shot down in eastern Ukraine. The plane went down July 17th, killing all 298 people on board. Of the dead, 194 were Dutch citizens and 37 were Australian citizens. Now, both countries' governments have expressed determination to see the dead brought home and the crash investigated. Now, the Malaysian Airlines flight was the third major international aviation disaster in one week. Air Algier Flight 5017 was carrying, we believe, 118 people when it lost contact. An eerie similarity as it was found in Gao Mali, another hot spot in the world. And we want to remember the victims of the Transasia Airlines flight that crashed after a failed emergency landing in Taiwan. 48 people were killed in that crash. And joining us now is my co-host and former White House aide, Dee Dee Benke, Sebastian Olick, he's an international attorney, and we have aviation expert Albert Goldson joining us once again. Thank you very much for joining us, everyone. Uh, what a week this has been, three plane crashes in one week. Uh, we've never really seen anything like this. Um, we want to begin with the updates on Malaysia right now. Obviously, uh, the uh, Dutch, uh, the uh, Netherlands is in deep mourning, as is uh, France right now. Um, Didi? Well, I think the optics are so disturbing. And, and, you, you, and you, it's, you have one flight go down like this, and then you have two more. So, you know, you, you, you have to think it must be related. However, with the Netherlands, I mean, they've got to be upset. And the Australians, because they are families, they have naked bodies that are being looted and luggage. And I mean, it's just a terrible sight because it's not being managed. It's not being handled correctly. So it's very sad. And just seeing all those visuals of people with the hearses coming in, um, just it's just so disturbing, as you said, Didi. Uh, right now, we obviously don't know what happened in Gao. Um, we don't know if it's been a, a, some sort of storm, as they've been talking about, or if they think that maybe something else happened. Um, any any ideas? I mean, w any thoughts on this? Well. <clears throat> that situation is probably related, more weather-related than it would be to potential terrorism. Uh, the militants in that area do not have the, um, the weapons that would be able to um, reach that, that aircraft. Um, and uh, in that situation, it would probably be more weather-related. And, and Albert, I know you're an aviation expert. They were talking about how in, in near the equator, um, it can be very tumultuous, even over at like 40,000 feet sometimes. Well, there were thunderstorm reports. There were thunderstorms and uh, a large sandstorms. And you have to realize that <clears throat> there aren't any planes or aircraft uh, that can fly above a thunderstorm. They have to go around, or possibly if they have onboard radar, to weave their way through the storm. So um, in that situation, uh, again, it's, it was, it's highly likely it's um, weather related. And, and this has just sent jitters through the aviation industry, if you will. I mean, not only did we have the three crashes, but we also had the uh, short ban uh, going into Tel Aviv. That's correct. So, I think so some of those crashes were preventable. Like, you know, the MH17, which flew, you know, Eastern Ukraine, that was preventable. You know, and since you mentioned before, you mentioned the, the Netherlands, it's such a irony that the Netherlands has actually opposed any kind of sanctions against Russia to back off and, you know, to control the terrorists, and now we are being hit with this horrible tragedy. Well, uh, absolutely, but when you also look at just the aviation industry just in general, I mean, this has been quite something. I, I do want to talk about um, what's happened with um, uh, Tel Aviv as well and, and the ban over there. Well, it's interesting because some people feel like the Obama administration, they were trying to punish yeah. Israel, and they think that that's the reason, not for the danger. So I don't know if I believe that or not, but some people, you know, they're, they're suspect of that. Why did they do that? I mean, was it really because they thought it was a danger, or were they trying to punish the country? I and know. I don't know if anybody saw, obviously, uh, Bloomberg, uh, the former mayor of New York, uh, uh, Michael Bloomberg, uh, actually said, I'm not going to listen to that ban, and flew in there on a private Good jet. Good for him. What, what were your thoughts on that? I thought that was great. I, I loved it. I thought it was great. It's like the Americans going in, it's like, you know what? It's too bad. I'm going to go in there and I'm going to help my people. I, I thought had, it was good. I had very similar impression that this ban of the flies to the Tel Aviv was politically motivated to put pressure on, on Israel to, you know, to, uh, to agree to the ceasefire. 
I, I don't believe there was really such a big threat if you compare it, you know, uh, the, the planes wouldn't fly over, you know, Gaza Strip. You know, uh, the Hamas didn't really target any kind of plane, but just through the missiles, you know, close to, to the airport. And it looked like suddenly everybody says we are not going over. So I, I had the impression it was Baltic Well, and it. actually, you know what? If you're going to be flying into somewhere, I trust Israel. I would feel safe in Israel. They've got their act together. They know what they're doing. So I... Well, well Didi, I'll, I'll ask you this question. Ted Cruz obviously blamed Obama for banning the flights, calling it an economic boycott on Israel. What that's who, yes, on? that's who I was referring to, actually. Uh, you know, and it could very well be the case. I mean, with this administration, who knows? I mean, but that would be really bad. You also have to realize the ban was for only 24 hours. Yeah. So it's not as if, well, we'll see when the conflict settles yeah, but down a bit. don't you think they buckled under pressure? They're like, what are you doing? So they, they looked at the ban. Interesting, though, how it was 24 hours. It was hours. more like to show that Israel is politically isolated, but you know, the majority of the country, even that's only for 24 hours. Well, I do want to go back to the Malaysian Airlines flight right now. Um, obviously, there's been a little bit of a little bit of pressure on Putin right now. Uh, is there enough pressure on him right now? And and what are your thoughts on that? We'll start with Didi. Uh, I think it was abominable how he acted. It's like, hey, it's not our fault. You know, nobody wants to hear that. And, and he also disappeared, I might add. Uh, of course, you know, and no one wants to hear that. They want his help. They want him to at least admit something that yes, they did aid. At the very least, he has to admit that, but he's not even doing that. The way he has acted, terrible leadership. Now, if Putin is found responsible for aiming, aiding the uh, separatists with missiles, what do you think the international community would, will do and should do? Uh, again, I'll start with Didi. Well, I hope finally someone will get a spine and do something. You know, Europe needs to come together, which almost never happens. In the United States, you know, Obama's just been weak. So, you know, something needs to happen. This guy, as we have said before, he will not stop without pressure. Now, Sebastian, you work in international law. That's correct. So let's talk about that. What, what, if, what if they do find that Putin armed the separatists with these missiles? I consider it to be an act of terrorism. I don't believe it's an act, uh, a war crime. I believe it's an act of terrorism. He's supplying the t uh, separatists with the weapons. We know that as a fact. As a, you know, a lot of uh, uh, intelligence agencies are supplying evidence. Now, this morning, actually, the European Union imposed sanctions, republished the sanctions against Russia. We sanctioned 18. Uh, political active, I mean politicians or, or, or governmental officials, 18 in comparison to 300 people dead, they just impose uh, uh, you know, sanctions on 18, so I call the sanctions of shame. Well, is, do you think that this is also going to bring uh, a lot of the spotlight back to Ukraine? Um, obviously now you've got the Netherlands involved, you've got Australia involved, you've got a lot of countries that are they're very upset and demanding to know what happened. I think that's very stupid, Mia, because, yeah, I think that does help Ukraine's efforts. Saying, like, look, this is what we're dealing with here. And, uh, you know, and actually, of course, they've taken back some of the towns. And there's still turmoil there, but at least I think it's moving in the right direction. Now, in terms of, let's, let's uh, check in with you, Albert, because um, obviously we want to just talk about, you know, the question that we posed last week about, you know, missiles being fired at planes. I think all of a sudden when we saw the flight go down in Mali, there is still a question whether that could happen or whether that did happen. Um, but do you think that there is more concern in the aviation industry right now because of that? Um, I don't think so. <clears throat> but you have to keep in mind that in a couple of days, um, the... Um, 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 International Aviation um, Civil Organization is meeting in Montreal to review aviation procedures with respect to flights in conflict zones. So they are addressing that issue and that organization is uh, a unit of the United Nations and they have a number of uh, states, uh, countries that do follow their recommendations and incorporate them legally into their um, aviation protocol and procedures. And I do want to point out that if you do, you know, if anybody does a Google right now, Google search of, of plane crashes, obviously you've got these three crashes in one week. Um, I want to point something out. Uh, according to the National Transportation Safety Administration, um, transportation deaths uh, for 2013, um, 803 rail, this is the uh, United States, of course, 706 marine, 33,500 highway deaths, 449 uh, aviation deaths. So uh, airline travel has become safer and I think that's one thing that we really want to stress because a lot of uh, a lot of articles are being written right now about these three crashes. Yeah, I mean, I'm not deterred. I, I mean, I feel very safe here in the United States. And in fact, you know, uh, they've even been yesterday uh, <laughs> in Canada, someone threatened a flight and they took it back to Toronto and we had 
uh, two military planes escort them back in our country. So I feel safe in America. I, I think we're doing a good job. Well, what about overseas? I mean, you're talking about America. I mean, uh, what about the hotspots? I would still go, but I feel better here. <laughs> no, but, but what I feel about, safer here. But I think it's a good question to ask in terms of flying in on hotspots because right now there are so many hotspots. That's correct. Well, well, particularly in Africa, you also have to keep in mind that um, Africa in many countries in Africa do not have the safety procedures, the training, et cetera, that meets international standards. Um, for a four-year period, um, commercial airline um, disasters were uh, made up 25% of all the world's aviation disasters. Um, but you have to realize that Africa commercial air traffic is significantly lower um, in terms of travel elsewhere. So going into developing countries, not only Africa, but other countries, you also have to realize lack of um, training, equipment maintenance, et cetera, that factors into a lot of these, um, these incidents. And I've traveled quite a bit in like, many international war zones and internet countries that were kind of hot spot areas. Um, one of the things that disturbed me about these crashes, though, if the Mali crash was related to weather and you had the Taiwan flight related to weather, um, should there be more protocols when flying in bad weather? And I don't know. I mean, I know you're rolling it out, but it seems just a little too much of a coincidence. I, that I don't. I mean, can you totally roll out that it's related? I don't think so. Um, I think they're completely unrelated. It's many times you have a very an industry with a very high safety record, and unfortunately, you have incidences that run into clusters. It's for example, you get up in the morning and you feel great but you break your shoelace, you break the heel on your shoe, you spill coffee on your, on your outfit, your cell phone goes on the fritz. They're completely unrelated and you're a very responsible three person. three in one week? Sometimes, I don't know. statistically, it's, sometimes those things happen. Well, right. I think just because of the Malaysian disappearance, uh, you know, and it's all been, uh, you know, front and center on the headlines. Um, we don't want to uh, not mention uh, Ukraine right now. Uh, the latest on Ukraine right now. Now, in the week since the Malaysian Airlines Flight 17 was shot down by a missile fire, fired from separatist territory, the Ukrainian, Ukrainian military has made significant strides retaking 10 towns held by separatists. But today there is news that a mayor of Ukraine town was shot dead and another mayor was fired at. We also want to mention that the Ukrainian prime minister has also resigned. Now, obviously, it's tragic about the mayor, but, you know, it just shows the times. So uh, still very volatile in that area. That's correct. Uh, I would say we're going to see parliamentary elections in the Ukraine probably in, in October. Now, in terms of the uh, mayor, one mayor being shot, the other one being targeted, I think what we are going to see is the separatists trying to spread the terrorist attacks all over the Ukraine, just to increase you know, the trauma and increase on, uh, the feeling of fear. Now, on the other hand, we are going to see probably NATO's response at some point that we are going to supply the Ukrainian government with some kind of uh, certain kind of weapons. We don't know that yet, but at least we know we are talking about it. Uh, at this point, we still have opposition from the from the U.S. government to do it, but hopefully that is going to change. Do we think any of these economic sanctions are going to hurt Putin? Um, um, he also, I don't know if anybody saw the pictures of him holding up that World Cup for <laughs> the... Uh, for I don't think that's what it is. I think that what will help the situation with Putin is that all eyes are on him with the crash and how he's handled a lot of things, which will make him, I think, back off. I think, the pre I think it's just pressure overall to make him back off not, and not have such a heavy hand. Uh, what did you think when you saw that uh, World Cup 2018? I mean, it, this is all propaganda, of course, um, but but still, he doesn't seem to be it's backing down. Putin. Yeah, he thinks he's master of the universe, you know. Well, basically, Putin is a thug, and he likes the limelight, and creating more instability in the Ukraine and employing these, for all intents and purposes, terrorist tactics. This is exactly what he wants. So again, the West has to have um, a very specific response on how to deal with basically a bully. And yeah, um, no World Cup for, for, for Russia. That's the first thing. Political uh, uh, isolation. It should be the expansion of sanctions. Said they, they said that they wouldn't do anything about that. Well, it has to be political pressure. You know, hopefully, yes. this something is going uh, to happen. Now, the sanctions have to expand. The last round of sanctions from the Obama administration was the best one, but it's still not enough. It should be more. Uh, they have the potential to economically hurt, you know, Russia in longer term, but not in a short one. Well, we certainly have uh, a great deal to talk about. We're going to take a very short break. Um, keep it here to Fresh Outlook. Right now, uh, it is quiet in Gaza as Israel's military pledged a 12-hour humanitarian truce. But can it last? We'll